this is the editing room, now emptied out, uh, for Screen 4, where I spent the last five months um, making it into the wonderful film it is with my editor, uh, Peter McNulty. My mother um, had a high school education. Uh, my father, I barely knew. He left the house when I was three. He died when I was four. He had a lot of jobs. He died at the factory, uh, working just a working guy. Uh, and my grandparents were, from one side of the family, uh, coal miners, and on the other side of the family, quarry workers in uh, Vermont. So good preparation for being a director. So my mother was a widow. Um, she raised three of us, my brother Paul, who just recently died, and my sister Carol and myself. Uh, nobody in the family had ever gone to college or really left Cleveland. And uh, my mother had just begun when my father died to get into this Baptist church uh, that really became, uh, in many ways, the, the base of our lives. One of the things about the, the church was that they believed movies were the work of the devil. The only films we were allowed to see were Disney films. so. No history, I think it's ironic, you know, that I'm in the film business and I have no history, really, of watching films except for Disney films. I went through, all the way through Wheaton College with that, until the very end, not seeing a film, and then I went to graduate school where the program was so intense, um, I never saw a movie. Um, I wrote a novel in one year, got a master's degree. Then it all started. I went away to uh, teach in a town um, in upstate New York, Potsdam, and I uh, was teaching humanities history of civilization, all those kind of courses. And they had a, uh, an art film house in town. And so my wife and I started to go check out the movies. And there I was seeing Bunuel and Fellini and Truffaut, Godard and Bergman. It was just like, just my, just, whoa, you know? And completely fell in love with, with movies. Towards the end of the period where I was just kind of searching for what I was going to do, finally got a job syncing up dailies on a small little featurette being made by a guy named Sean Cunningham, who happened to be my same age. We had kids the same age, almost the same names. And we just and he was working with a filmmaker named Roger Murphy, who was a great kind of cinematographer with 16 millimeter camera. That came out and was made for a group of theater owners in Boston. And they next told Sean, we want a scary movie for our theaters. Um, and you know, I was basically out of work because that the first film had stopped. And Sean said, uh, they want a scary movie. Go write something scary. If they if they like it, you can direct it, and you can cut it on my machine, and I'll produce it, and it'll you know we'll laugh and scratch and have a good time. So I went uh, to Long Island, I think on a Memorial Day weekend, at a friend's house, and in four days wrote Last House on the Left. We shot it like a documentary. The building we were working in was full of documentary filmmakers. Richard Leacock was there, who just died this week. D.A. Pennybaker, who do, did Don't Look Back, um, and a lot of other guys of that sort. So I knew those basic skills, and we found a documentary uh, cameraman, and we went out and shot it just as we would stage the scene. Uh, there would be no cut from beginning to end, and we shot it basically from three basic angles. and moved on, you know, and jumped over fences. We had no permits. It was all just totally, totally uh, illegal and without uh, any sort of official existence. And took it back to New York and over the course of I don't know how many months, because it was very hard to put together, uh, made this film and sent it up to the guys, the guys in Boston, as we used to call them. And uh, they opened it at their theaters, and we immediately got reports that there were uh, protests, there were fistfights in the theater, people tried to get at the uh, projectionists to destroy the print, projectionists themselves were cutting up the <laughs> prints. It caused a phenomenon and so people started lining up around the block. And John and I were very nervous about it, it was like, you know, we had done something that we were starting to realize was very powerful and offended a lot of people. Um, and those of our friends that saw it in New York never looked at us the same again. I mean, uh, certainly I was very aware that people kept their children away from me for one thing. Uh, so it was like we were kind of pariahs. And then Sam Arkoff, um, American International Pictures, one of the great old timers, heard about it and bought it and took it national. So this thing that we had kind of done and thought nobody would ever see it uh, suddenly was national. And with the exception of Roger Ebert, who at that time was relatively unknown, a critic named Robin Wood. Everybody hated the film, thought it was despicable, um, 
I remember one review, why don't they crawl back under the rock they crawled out from under. Um, so that was my beginning. <laughs> you know, I had come to New York on a teacher's salary, then I'd been supporting myself and my family with driving a cab, basically. And the first time I got a check on that film, it was $50,000. And I didn't have a credit card to my name. Uh, we, did, we, had no, we had to sell our cars, and we were just totally dead broke. And I had to go down. I remember going to the Bank of New York and walking in there with a $50,000 check. I said, I don't know what to do with this. So we'll start you an account, sir. And we'll get you an American Express card, and we're just going to set you up. That film, uh, I think, re returned maybe $100,000 over the course of the next two years. And both Sean and I lived off of that for almost five years, writing all sorts of other things, not wanting to ever do another movie like Last House on the Left. Well, The Attraction of Red Eye was, A, it wasn't a horror film. And I was wanting to branch out. And, and B, maybe, maybe this should be first, is that it was a great script. And it was all there. You know, there were very, very things things that needed to change. I, uh, my pitch when I went into the studio was I thought the third act, uh, it, was, um, it was fought in a house that was not her own and not in her family and, and the film ended up with the character going back to her childhood home where her father was living and, and having the final fight in that home, which I just thought grounded it much more and she was defending her childhood home. It was in great shape from the get-go and I had just come off of uh, Cursed which uh, was a film I did with the Weinstein Company <laughs> that took two and a half years, went through four major scripts, and ended up coming out and dying. You know, so it was a horrible experience, and I actually started on uh, Red Eye while I was still finishing post-production on Curse, just to get my hands on a script that was good and together, and um, you know, in a way, away from the Weinsteins for a while. You know, we, we've, we've had some rough times. I, we're in great condition now, but uh, you know, it's a very volatile company. Um, but they're very passionate about their films. So uh, anyway, that's that was the red eye experience, and uh, it just went very fast. I think we did the entire film in nine months, from beginning to end. Nightmare on Elm Street was um, an idea that I had basically just based on the idea of somebody kind of being able to touch you in your dreams. And I had this kind of an image of this person just kind of leaning out of the ether of the air and touching the sleeper. That, and that was it, you know. Uh, so I had done two films back to back. I had done The Deadly Blessing and Swamp Thing. I had some money, enough money to live for a year, and I said, okay, I'm going to commit myself to write this. So it took about a year on and off um, of writing and trying it out on friends. Everybody thought the idea was really scary and wonderful in a way. Um, and so when I had a script, I um, started sending around town, and nobody was interested. Um, but there had been one guy, Bob Shea, uh, at the head of a very small company at the time, New Line Cinema that had a small storefront office in New York on 8th Avenue. And I'd met him a couple of years before, and he'd always said, I love your films. If you ever do anything, you know, um, give me a call. So I sent it to him, and he really liked it. But he was not in a position of power that he later was in, and he was not able to find the money for um, those three years. So those three years, I went through all, all, my, <laughs> all my savings. I had to sell my house. I was like making lists. Of how much can I get for my guitar? I wonder, you know, stuff like that. And uh, was borrowed money from Sean Cunningham to pay my taxes, and then I had nothing. And right about that time, um, a friend of mine found uh, money to do uh, Hills of Ice 2, which we went out and did under very cheap circumstances. And right after that, Bob Shea found the money to do uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> Genesis of Scream is, it wasn't me sitting down and writing, you know, all credit goes to Kevin Williamson here. He was a kid that had been in town, I think, for about four years, writing tiny little things and nothing much had happened, I believe. Um, he came up with this script that uh, was an immediate bidding war. I got, I got a look at it, but my little company that I had at the time couldn't afford to compete with the big boys. And the Weinstein brothers uh, then had a Miramax uh, outbid everybody else, as they often do. And so 
Bob picked up the phone and called me, thank God, and said, uh, I'm going to send you a script. I think you're right for it. And, you know, and I read it. And I, there's two things you're aware of. First, that the humor and the dialogue and everything else is it's dangerous in a way, you know, and it's, it has a deep sort of cynical humor to it that, that's visceral. I actually passed on it. And uh, I had been having my usual qualms about I'm doing this for too long and making films about people being cut up and I should go do another music of the heart, whatever. And uh, so I passed. And uh, at that time, Drew Barrymore was going to star. And then I went to, I was signing autographs at a Comic-Con convention or something like that, and a little kid came up to me and I gave him my autograph. He says, sir, I, I, I love your, your early films, but you've gone soft and you need to make a kick-ass film again like Last House. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, it was almost like, you know, you look back and then there was a little, either a little demon or a little angel because it really made me realize that you can't be squeamish and do what I do. And there's always a part of me that's kind of liberal and I shouldn't be doing this and blah, blah, blah. But uh, this was a powerful script and I knew it. So I called Bob back. Bob back up. He said, I knew you'd call back. And by the way, Drew doesn't want to start, but she wants to play the opening. And I thought that was a catastrophe. And said, no, 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 it's going to be great. It's going to be great. No, no, you stay with them, but uh -huh. just give a little bit more room. I found over the years that one of the key elements, so there's two key, key elements. One is script. It has to be really, and uh, the other is casting. And you have to find extraordinary people and follow your deepest instincts about things. Um, we had cast most of the major roles. Uh, we still had Nancy's boyfriend, and um, we were so seeing all kinds of guys. I remember being at somebody bringing in Johnny Depp. I think it was the guy who played the coroner, and uh, we had cast him. And he says, "Listen, I have a friend, Johnny Depp, and he's he's in a band. They're playing at the Cobra Room, <laughs> Viper Room, rather, and he's interested in acting. And, and what do you think?" And I said, "Well, send him in." So we came in. He had had a headshot made. And uh, I was looking at two other guys, typically handsome young Hollywood teens. And I went home that night with three, you know, eight by tens. Um, the pictures that all actors present to you when they're coming in. And my daughter, um, Jessica, was 14 at the time. Um, I was saying, what do you think, Jessica, this guy, he's a surfer and blah, blah, blah. And this guy is got, you know, kind of, he says, Dad, Johnny Depp, who is he, Johnny Depp? <laughs> you know, I said, really? Because I thought, you know, Donny came in, he had he chain smoke, unfiltered cigarettes, his fingers were all yellow from nicotine, I mean, and he looked kind of pale and said, and I said, why him? He says, he's beautiful. <laughs> and that was it. I said, okay. And, you know, the role wasn't huge. Um, and his friend said, I'll, I'll take care of him. And so every time Donny was going to go on, his friend would be running his lines with him. Remember, I've only seen this with a couple actors where you actually could see their their skin trembling, you know, it was just always like sweaty palms and everything else, but he pulled it off and, you know, he had that natural ability to do it very without acting like he was acting. And obviously, very quickly went on the 21 Jump Street and other great things, but uh, that was one of, uh, that's certainly one of my best finds. The most wonderful person to work with, she's very funny. She's obviously supremely talented. She uh, very professional. Um, one of the directors of her early films, I think Sophie's Choice, was killed in a freak accident on the Long Island uh, freeway during um, during filming. She asked for a half an hour to just get herself together. Came back right back to work. Ready? Here we go. And roll set. She also stayed in character between takes so that we had all these rambunctious kids that were always wanting to saw on their violins and make this cacophony. She would stay the teacher and say, hey, 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 keep it quiet over there, <laughs> you know. So she kept that whole shoot together with, with those kids. There's no way that I, as a director, could say, hey, quiet down over there. And she just had a great time doing it, and we had a great time working together. Drew was spectacular to work with, and she just totally threw herself into it, and, you know, went through all the casting, and finding just the right people for everything. But that, that was, uh, I think in all the screams, it was because it was completely written. The, um, the only thing I had to figure out was how to make it work in certain locations. So some of the chases and set pieces changed that way. Kevin had just written a figure in a ghost mask. So as soon as a director, since you're dealing with a you know, visual medium as opposed to a print, 
you know, that you can't just put a mask on somebody. If I put a mask on you, I'd still be able to know it was you, you know, as opposed to the other people in the room. So um, we started devising this costume that ended up a costume that would basically cover every square inch of the person. Uh, but it even went farther than that. Uh, black shoes for the killer. Okay, everybody that was a, could be a suspect wore black shoes, and they all had to be basically the same height. So you know, it was there were a lot of things like that that uh, were very tricky to, to keep the suspense up and not make it. Uh, at you at the end, you reveal it's a 300-pound character, but uh, they somehow look thin for the rest of the movie in the ghost face costume. So you know, there was a lot of a lot of stuff that a director does that. Uh, Done, but it, the script itself, the story was was there, and there was none of that agony of, uh, you know, trying to make script notes, get the script right, and then, and then you leave. Ghostface, my buddy, uh, this mask or one very very like it, it was much older actually, was on the um, bed in the upstairs of a house that we were looking at in uh, Santa Rosa. It was sitting on the on two pillows in this very very nice little grandma's <laughs> house, and uh, you know I've been looking for the, a mask that was a ghost mask. We didn't really know what it would or should look like, but we were getting close to production. And I said, "Where, where did you get this? This is like this is amazing." And we're doing a film about a ghost face guy. Can we borrow this? Just, yeah, sure. Her, it turns out her husband had collected Halloween masks. And the mask clearly was old and had been you know, worn around the edges and everything else. And, but we couldn't find any brand on it. So called Bob Weinstein. He said, well, get your art, art department to make you something like it, but not too close so we get sued. I probably do the worst Bob imitation of anybody. But um, so we, we went through a period of trying to devise a mask that was scary. But you know, didn't look like this, so we would get sued. But we were also, the studio was trying to find who made it. And right towards the end, in fact, I shot the first day using the mask against studio orders because the other masks just looked terrible. And the next day we got word that the studio had found on the, I don't know whether it's still there, but on the original, they found right along the edge of the mask, there was just embossed the words, Fun World. And then they did a global search of that and found this little mom and pop com company in uh, New England that probably their entire you know, capital intake and in the year was uh, $10,000. But uh, it was part of their inventory and they'd had it since the 50s, I think. So um, a deal was quickly made, as they say. So that's, that's how it came to be. The ad. Brilliant background. Action. Music of the Heart came about this way. Um, I had made uh, Scream 1. Nobody knew whether it was going to work or not. We had a screening, a test screening in Secaucus, New Jersey, and it went through the roof, just through the roof. And I, I remember Bob Weinstein was sitting at the end of my row, and behind him, coming in late, was Harvey Weinstein, who sat two rows behind him. He had a big bag of M&Ms, and through the whole movie, he was throwing them and hitting Bob in the back of the head and chuckling, because I don't think he'd ever seen an audience react like that. Um, and at the end, uh, the scores were just astronaut. It was the best test score they had ever had. Okay, so they disappear, and my editorial staff and I, a uh, producer at that time, said, let's get something to eat. So we went back into New York and uh, down in the village where there was a restaurant that served late. And uh, we were sitting there kind of celebrating and thinking, what will we change? And, you know, we didn't, couldn't think of anything really that needed to be changed when the Weinstein brothers reappeared and kind of shouldered everybody out of the way and came up next to me and said, we're gonna offer you a three picture deal right now. And Scream 2 and Scream 3 are two of those movies. And uh, the, uh, the, the third movie will be something that you can choose from anything that we own the rights to. At a certain point, Harvey was saying, Wes, what do you think about Madonna? And he said, I know her, she's great. She's gonna be in Chicago for us. Um, why don't we just have a meeting? and just get to know each other. So next thing I know, we're in a meeting with Madonna in our offices and you know she's very sweet and she's read the script and she likes it and very quickly Harvey said, so Madonna, you want to do the film? She said, yes. So Wes, you want to do the film with Madonna? <laughs> it's like, what are you going to say, no? So then began the process of uh, working with Madonna to learn the role, learn how to play violin. And, and I have to say that Madonna is very smart and was incredibly um, 
dedicated to learning to, to play the violin properly, but she also was very opinionated by where she wanted to take the script, and it wasn't in the direction I wanted to go. So at a certain point, um, I said to Harvard, this is not going to work out. He said, I can't fire Madonna. We're going to use her in, in Chicago. She'll kill me. She won't be in it. You're going to have to do it. So I had to go to Madonna's apartment and uh, you know, say it wasn't working, and that was, that was stunning. So then we were in the situation, well, who's going to play her? Um, and we said, how about Meryl Streep? And uh, the <laughs> Barbie will kill me, but he said, Meryl Streep, she can't sell tickets. She's, been, uh, she's always dying, she's always sad, she's always crying. Nobody wants to see that. So we went through a long list of actresses. And it reached the point where um, there was no more money. It seems to be a familiar story in my career. Uh, we had to close our production offices. We were down just to uh, a few secretaries. We had already sold all the office equipment. The wardrobe was in boxes. And um, I said, Harvey, give me, give me just a shot with Mel Street. And uh, so they approached her and she said, you just done Dancing in the NASA and one other film back to back. Because I don't want to do a film for at least a year. I want to be around my kids. So I, on my own, sat down and wrote, I think one of the most successful letters in my career. And I just poured out my heart to her and said how much this meant to me and how I thought she was born for the role and blah, blah, blah. And two days later, I got a call from her agent and said, who said, uh, Meryl wants to talk to you. So um, I was given the number, called up, <laughs> suddenly, hello, hello. And I'm talking to Meryl Streep. She said, I want you to know that you scared my daughter so much with the Scream series because we live at the end of a long, quiet road in the woods. So I just uh, laid out what I thought this film could be. And at the, there was a long pause at the end, probably a 20 minute conversation, mostly me talking. And uh, then she said, okay, I'll do it. I don't have a favorite film of all the films I've made. Um, I think some um, succeeded on a co both a commercial and a artistic level more than others, <laughs> needless to say. Uh, the Last House, I think, was by far my hardest hitting film. The Rost. Um, it's not a film I go back and watch. Uh, the Hills of Eyes, I could go back and watch and have some fun with it. Nightmare on Elm Street, I think, because it was the first film I just wrote completely on my own without even a friend producer saying, go write something. To me, it was a composite character that got whittled down to the core character by the end of the film. So I never, you know, people always say, why do you enjoy killing teenagers? And I, I don't. I, I, I enjoy killing characters that don't make it in life, <laughs> you know? Because it's fiction, it's, it's a composite. Um, it's talking about what works in life and what, what doesn't, ultimately. Perfect, cut, cut! Very nice, Drew! I have a hard time at this point thinking that I'll find something that will be quite so engaging and that I can do so well. I've been doing this for 40 years now, so it is what I do in a way, is make movies, and most often scary movies, but you know, I know how to make a movie it touches me deeply. I can't think of another thing that I can do this well that I would care to do. We all have particular talents. We all have particular strengths and weaknesses. Um, I certainly have a deep appreciation for other guys who are doing the same thing I do, and women, because it's hard. And it's not rewarded the way, you know, standard films are. Cut it! Cut it! Check the game! Yeah. If I were to think of something to say to the fans, I would say thank you. Thank you for being there. Appreciate what I do. Uh, sometimes give me a little rap on the head to get me going back in the right direction. But most of all, um, I think that you are the proof that everything that people say that don't like horror movies, uh, everything they say that horror movies do to people is disproved by you because you've turned out to be one of the greatest people I've met and the most gentle souls and uh, get all the humor and everything else in my films too. So thank you. Thank you for all you've given.